If you do not get engaged, put your resources, I'm talking about your time and your money and your knowledge, your freaking network behind this, it won't happen. And the other side, Kevin Sabet and Smart Approaches to Marijuana, do not have any doubt about the fact that they are mobilizing already. We know this. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of The Dime. I'm Brian Fields, and with me, as always, is Kellen Finney. And this week, we've got a very special guest, Shane Pennington, partner at Portner Wright. Shane, thanks for taking time. How are you doing today? Doing great. Really happy to be here. Side diving. Kellen, how are you doing? I'm doing really great. Really excited to talk to Shane. Really excited to dive into this mess that is the federal cannabis law. How are you, Brian? I'm stoked. I think rescheduling is a topic that is on everybody's mind, but I think the problem is not everyone understands the intricacies involved. And I think before we get into East Coast, West Coast, uh, understanding Shane, I know you have a loyalty, maybe not to East or West Coast. Do you want to put yourself on the map, please? I mean, to the extent I have loyalties is to Texas. That's where I'm born and raised. And kind of once you're born there, that sticks with you. So I live in New York now because I have greater loyalties to my wife, but that's about it. Texas is my state and my coast. Smart man, uh, look to the wife there. You never go wrong there. So Shane, before we dive deep into rescheduling, I think it's important to talk about some of the players involved and then just put a bow on it. Is it as massive of a reform as everyone believes it could be? Yeah, so the players involved, I mean, you've got HHS makes the evaluation and recommendation to DEA. DEA then involves the public. The public has their say, which is extremely important. Then we get a final rule from DEA eventually. And then presumably, I would imagine this one's going to the court. It'll go to a federal court of appeals and then it'll be finalized. And is it a big deal? Yeah, it's, I mean, pretty much, I think, unquestionably the biggest deal in, in federal cannabis policy since Nixon signed the Controlled Substance Act in the law in 71. So um, it's a huge deal. And I think people, don't fully understand why. And I think part of the reason that, that they don't understand why is because they have mistaken assumptions about like what the alternatives are, right? So, you know, a lot of people say, well, descheduling is the only way, right? And if it's not descheduling, then it's not significant. And they actually don't understand what descheduling means and doesn't mean. And their opposition to schedule three threatens to keep it in schedule one, right? Which would be a complete and kind of humiliating disaster, for, I think, for the cannabis reform movement, given that it's like, you just can't be helped. I mean, if the president of the United States kicks this off where you like serves it up on a silver platter and you get in the way of it, and then we're stuck in schedule one for who knows how long, that would be a worst case scenario and one we should all do everything possible to avoid. So where are we today, January 11th currently? And then let's kind of go from there. Sure. So we have we have HHS's scheduling recommendation uh, has been sent to DEA. That's a big part of this because HHS's views are binding on DEA for scientific and medical stuff, which is a lot of this. And so it kind of cabins like DEA's discretion to a good degree. Now the process involves, you know, DEA's got to look at that. They've got to put a proposed rule in the federal register. That's the next step. That's what we're waiting on. Then there will be a 60 day public comment period. People can ask for hearings before an administrative law judge as well. And those hearings are on the record. So you could like put on witnesses, you could cross-examine, you can put on uh, evidence, you can, you know, brief it. It's a full, like kind of like a full-blown trial on the proposed rule. And the ALJ, the administrative law judge, will look at all of that, resolve the objections, make findings of fact and conclusions of law. Then DEA has to look at all the comments, all the ALJ stuff after it's all been submitted and completed, and then it will issue a final rule. The administrator will issue a final rule that will appear in the federal register. It will have to be, its effective date will have to be 30 days after it appears in the federal register. Um, that's just sort of how it is, unless DEA finds good cause, but you know there are exceptions, but generally it has to be a 30 day delay. And during that 30 days, another important thing happens, that's a period that anybody can seek judicial review in a federal appellate court. And so I suspect that whichever way this goes, it's sort of a Goldilocks situation. There will very likely be, you know, so people saying the porridge is too hot or the porridge is too cold, regardless of which way it comes out, how it comes out. 
and we're likely to see litigation. And that's important because under certain circumstances, well, it's important because the court could change the decision, right? So you're not done once you're done is the problem. But then beyond that, I think for many people who are interested in 280E relief and sort of getting this, like actually getting the benefits of rescheduling um, as soon as possible, a court, when litigation is filed, can, under certain circumstances, stay the effective date even longer of a final rule, right? So it's not automatic, but they can under certain circumstances. And so that will probably be a fight at the beginning of the lawsuit. And for those of you who are interested in, you know, seeing cash flow, for example, you're going to have to hope that you win that battle of, you know, not staying the effective date of the final rule. And then you have to hope that you win the litigation, too so that you can preserve the win. So there's a long there's a long way to go. And we can talk timelines and all, but I'll just say right now, this process normally takes a very long time, but this is an unprecedented situation and HHS did its part really quickly. And so there's good reason to hope that it will be way faster than normal. Even that, you know, that said, you heard how complicated this is. Like I just explained it. The average time for this process to take historically has been 9.2 years. So we got a long way to go. And even if we move at, you know, bullet train speed, you know, those who are predicting that it'll be done by the, the you know, in time for uh, the election. I mean, I, I hope so. Um, but that would be, in my experience, and my knowledge of the process and the history, that would be extremely fast, like kind of unfathomably fast. And I mean, one thing to think about is like, we don't have the proposed rule yet. So if we get to February 1st and we don't have a proposed rule and we get to March 1st, like at some point it becomes like impossible for an agency with a small staff to get it done that fast. So is there any like political influence that say like the Democrats could have because it is an election year to try to like expedite this kind of a process from a timeline perspective, or is it just completely out of their hands? I would analogize it to something like this. Like if you put a gun to my head and said, you know, we're holding your, your five-year-old daughter ransom and you have to run a sub four hour marathon to save her and yourself. I would run as fast as I could, right? But I'm a 40 year old man and I don't run. So I would do it, I would die trying, but I would probably die trying. I would not actually be able to run a sub four hour marathon, even if you put all the guns to my head and and pulled every lever to influence me, right? And I think that is, it's not that I'm saying the administration won't or hasn't already put all of the influence that they have and expedited it as much as possible. What I'm saying is there are some parts of this that are just out of DEA's control. Like it can't control how many comments it receives from the public, right? And this is a very big, I mean, I'm going to be commenting because you have to comment to preserve issues for judicial review. So if you don't comment, then you won't be able to, you, you, you know, you get a win and it'll just get overturned because you didn't build the administrative record. So you've got to comment. But when you comment, they have to consider and respond to significant comments, which is every comment they receive that, if it were true, would require a change in the rule. That's the law. So, you know, there's really no way around. I mean, there was a telemedicine rule that came out recently that they got over 39,000 comments on that one. And you've probably never even heard of it. And so something like this, I expect they're going to get a deluge. And, you know, people have told me, well, they can you know, they can repeat comments, they can just respond to them all in one one fell swoop. That's true. But just going through tens of thousands of comments and identifying and organizing them and to respond to them in, in mass is extremely difficult work and challenging. So, and that's not even counting the ALJ hearings. So you can tell the ALJ to move quickly, but how quickly can you do an on the record hearing when people are putting on witnesses and raising all kinds of objections and you've got to resolve them in writing, that has to be reviewed by the administrator. I know this is technical and boring, but if people are actually interested in getting it done quickly, they need to understand that it is akin to asking me to run that marathon, right? They'll do their best. And I'm not saying they won't. And the last thing I want to say about this is Howard Sklamberg, who's actually run the process inside FDA the last time it went down. He's a partner at Arnold and Porter, a guy I respect very much. We agree about absolutely everything, except he believes that this will get done by the election. And I've said that I'm like, I'm skeptical of that. But I admit he's older and wiser than I am. And he's been closer to the process. Now, he doesn't know. I don't you know, I don't think he would say he knows more about the DEA process and history than I do. I'm just saying that I've never actually run one of these agencies, one of these offices. Right. He has. So I'm very hopeful that it'll get done that fast. I just am worried. 
I think all those are fair and we could definitely elaborate on some of those because I, I want to dive deep into the comment period and some of those. But I want to stay with the ALJ. What are the two parties involved? Who puts up the witnesses? How does that work? And who are the resources behind these two like opposing forces? So there's not necessarily an opposing force, right? It's like it's you know, I said it's trial like that's true. But really, there's a proposed rule. Like, say, like, let me give a concrete example. Let's say there's a proposed rule that says that cannabis has an abuse potential that is lower than most substances in Schedule 2, right? It kind of has to say that for, for HHS to have recommended Schedule 3, right? And so if I'm Kevin Sabet in Smart Approaches to Marijuana, I'm going to gather all the evidence I can to say that's false, right? And there's, frankly, a lot under the, the prevailing standards right? DEA has consistently found that, HHS consistently found that until this most recent recommendation. So he's going to gather all that, gather every little bit and scrap he can, and just put on witnesses, you know, to say to the ALJ, the fact finder, the, the administrative law judge, look, I know that HHS said this. Here's why they said it. That is wrong. It doesn't consider all this evidence. It misinterprets the standard. It is an unlawfully you know, it's inconsistent with past precedent, on and on and on, right? And then you know, they could even get uh, put on their own witnesses and then others could come back and say, no, no, no. Not only is, is it lower than the substances in Schedule 2, it's lower than the substances in Schedule 3 and 4 or 5. And here's all the evidence of that. And now the ALJ has mountains of evidence, on top of a multi-hundred page analysis from HHS and presumably an additional, at least I would imagine, 50 to 100 pages from DEA and a whole slew of questions just on abuse potential, right? That's just one prong. So, and that's that's one person who has probably a staff of, you know, they might have a, a clerk, you know, that helps them, maybe two or three. You tell me. I mean, it sounds money. like hard work and it and sounds like, you know, being done by government employees who aren't like me, where, you know, the billable hour and I work day and night, you know, that's not how they operate, nor should they. So. So who's on the other side of Kevin? Would it be someone like from your team? Would it be DA? Who, I, hope, who's I hope somebody's on the other side. You know, uh, I hope it's my team. Right. But has anyone hired me to do that? So no, it would be like a collection of the people in the cannabis industry or people pro the rescheduling with them would have to come together to to guess defend put on the other evidence yeah. or he will be unrebutted right that's yeah. that's what i'm talking about so everybody and pardon me for being fired up about this oh, this is i love this it fired love up it. because i'm on <laughs> to everybody out there who's a reform advocate who wants to see rational cannabis policy which i think we can all broadly agree would require some dramatic changes in this area okay and like i'm sure we could disagree about things at the margins but trust me, at least for purposes of this conversation, that I'm probably largely on your side, okay? And I'm working hard, often for free, to, to help with these things, okay? This is why most of what I see out there in social media and with people I talk to, and these, again, are the people who are engaged on this, right? And who support my position, generally. We agree. They're like, when's this getting done? Like, this should already have happened. Like, this is ridiculous. We we're right, they're wrong, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, and and therefore they're just waiting with their arms crossed for for somebody else to do something for them. And they don't realize it's up to you. If you do not get engaged, put your resources, I'm talking about your time and your money and your your knowledge, your freaking network behind this, it won't happen. And the other side, Kevin Sabet and Smart Approaches to Marijuana. Do not have any doubt about the fact that they are mobilizing already. I mean, we know this, right? We're on their freaking email feed. We see what they're doing. They're already preparing for litigation, right? So it's time, people. You can't sit still and like let this and just think you're entitled to, you know, and, and it, what really bothers me is not only are we, does everybody act like they're entitled to it should have already happened and, and all this. They also act like it may not even be a good thing. It, they, it doesn't dawn on them that Kevin Sabet and some art approaches to marijuana, the very fact that they're mobilizing and putting all of their resources to, uh, to oppose this speaks volumes, right? If you're opposing this, you're on Kevin Sabet's side. Think about that, okay? 
and have a really good explanation for why that is before you come talk to me about how I don't I don't know how you know whether this is good or bad. And okay, so I'll stop with that, and I, I'm happy to respond to the particular objections. I'm sure I hope we get to many of them, but yeah, this is up to us, and we definitely need to be prepared to get engaged on on the uh, administrative process when the time comes. To define up to us, right? So just to be super clear, is are we talking about operators, MSOs? Are we talking about smaller states? Like collectively, everyone needs to unify in a single, let's call it resource or bucket, ready to weaponize um, like, like or unify the resources collectively in order to oppose. Is that kind of the way you would see it? Yes. So there's a comment period. That comment period plus these ALJ hearings are going to create. OK, so let me back up. The HHS recommendation and evaluation, DEA's proposed rule, the comments that people do or do not make, right? The ones that actually are put in and filed with DEA, okay, in that 60-day period. The ALJ record, right? Meaning the transcripts of the proceedings, the filings, the evidence that's submitted and accepted, and DEA's final rule, right? That is going to be what's called the administrative record, okay? The administrative record is the closed universe of everything that the court will be able to look at to decide whether this thing stands or falls. Like, assume we get a Schedule Three decision. That administrative record will be all that a court can look at as it evaluates whether to overturn that decision or not, right? That means if you have a lot of great ideas and you know there are all these studies that are out there and you have a big stake in this, and you sit there on the sideline as this administrative process goes through and don't get it in that administrative record, you will never have another chance to get it in. That's it. It's over. And now we're stuck with whatever is, it is in that stack of documents. Okay? That's why it's so critical that if you have something to say about this and you care about it, we need, yes, if you're an MSO, if you're, if you're somebody who want, who's invested in the cannabis space, and you don't like 280E, right? Because it's screwing up your life. You, you know, you have skin in the game, right? And if you think that Schedule 3, I mean, look, if you think that Schedule 3 would be a good thing, you should be defending it. And lots of lots of people who, even if you're not like, you know, deep pocketed, or you're not um, an expert yourself, you might know a lot of people who are experts. Do you know doctors and scientists who've done these studies? Are you connected? You know what I'm saying? On and on. If you know, if you're connected to folks at the state level who are who are lawmakers, regulators, right, who have experience with this, even if they're former ones, and they, you know, you've sat at dinner over drinks and they've ranted about this and they make really compelling points, get them involved, right? And as far as like, do we all need to file one big document or can we file many? Those are strategic choices that we should all be talking about and getting organized around. And that's why you hire professionals. And this is where people think that I'm like, you know, just trying to build business for myself. Look, forget that. Hire somebody else, right? I don't care. You know, would I like to be able to do this? Yes, but it's not, you know, if I wanted to get rich, this isn't the area I would have gone into, okay? You know, I'm doing this because I care just like you. But if that's your concern, hire somebody else. But please, by all means, for God's sakes, get in the game. So there, there is organizations like Normal, American for Safe Access. So it's like, someone taking some money and donating it to them does that move the needle at all like is there a way to like unify americans for safe access normal and some of these other like organizations so that they are uh, literally opposing the other side in a unified manner and cohesive like what does that kind of look like from like an opposing force perspective so i hesitate to speak about i mean those are great organizations and the ones that you've listed i just haven't been in contact with them recently enough about this Mm -hmm. You know where they are. But in general, what I would say is I do know that there are a lot of different views out there. But yeah. I do think that most of us, regardless of what, how, you know, what we think, I actually think we disagree about a lot less than than it seems. And what is for sure is we all know Schedule 1 is a catastrophe and a nightmare. Right. And if that much is true, and if you think 280E relief and removing the criminal penalties associated with 280E that all that affect you regardless of if you're a small minority owned cannabis company or you're a great big, you know, non-minority owned MSO or whatever it is, the, the, the rain falls on everyone equally with 280E, okay? And it's criminal penalties. It's not just money. You go, you, you don't give the IRS theirs, you're going to jail, okay? So 
let's be clear about what what we can all agree about. And yes, we should put our we need to t- have conversations among our movement, right? Among all the stakeholders. So we can say, look, we might disagree about certain policy things or what should be the priority down the line and all that. But I respect you and we uh, we agree about this and we should unify around this and we should work out our differences and try to yes, speak with a unified voice. That takes a lot of coordination and it takes a lot of effort to do that, right? And in order to, you're not going to be able, if you wait until the proposed rule comes out, which it might be there in our inboxes now, right? If you wait till then, it will be too late because you only have 60 days. And that thing we know, just the, just the uh, HHS recommendation that we got the redacted copy of is hundreds of pages long. You know what I mean? Just reading it will take a lot of time. So that's why I'm, I feel a lot of urgency to get people, get this message across. Everybody just stop fighting and get ready for this historic moment. I think those points are extremely clear and I appreciate you kind of laying into them because I didn't understand kind of what you had proposed because I guess I assumed, which was silly of me now thinking back, that like we were already preparing for these efforts and maybe we are and and I'm just not aware, but it seems like everything that we're doing to not be proactive, to unify around this is playing into the opposing hands of distraction, separation, additional comments, expanding the thing. Because if we have a very short time frame, we need to be unified in order to minimize the certain distractions or opportunities to kind of layer into the various differences of different roadmaps we could go from a uh, conversational standpoint, which could then could only hurt us from the time frame. Exactly like you said, if you have to achieve something by a certain date and we don't start sooner rather than later, we have no chance at all. Yes, exactly. That's right. And I mean, part of the issue is that you know, even after I say this, and if people hear this, they're going to get worked up and they're like, well, now what do I do? Right. Contact those organizations, contact me, contact, you know, basically anyone who's working on this will be able to put you in touch with the people that you need to talk to. And I'm happy to talk to people. I talk to them all the time. You know, I especially like talking to the organizations that disagree with me about this, because I think it's so important that we unify, right? And I think that I can, I think if you talk to me, you will find that I respect you. I understand where you're coming from. And I think that you'll find me persuasive. You know, I, I know what your objections are. And we can, we can talk about them. And, and I'm all ears, man. Because like at the end of the day, what I end up telling people is you're right. That goal you have is a very, very vital one in the bigger picture, right? But right now we have to, decide what to do about this set of facts that has arisen, right? We have a Schedule 3 recommendation. Something's happening. Like, there will be a decision, okay? And it's going to be one thing or another thing. So shut all the noise out, and let's focus on that together and see if we can work together to optimize this historic opportunity. That's it. And like I said, you talk to me or, the, you know, the, the organizations you listed, Normal, Americans for Safe Access, you know, uh, Matt Zorn, you know, Andrew Klein, Howard Sklamberg. Like, I, I know the people I know, but if you start trying to get involved, you're going to get in touch with, you know, somebody who can plug you in. We'll link all that in the show notes, too, for everyone that's listening. <laughs> um, but, I mean, it's been, right, the Colorado has had, uh, Colorado and Washington have had, quote unquote, recreational cannabis for like a decade almost now. And all of these kind of like, points that people are kind of divided on at least on the um so on on our side right i think they're all mute right because at the end of the day this is the first real movement from a federal level on rescheduling or changing to the cannabis policy so it's almost like a, a rising tide raises all ships moment for us right i believe that there are however objections coming from all directions. I think they're misguided. And, you know, I would love to take them up one at a time. You know, the idea that Schedule 3 is this um, Trojan horse for that's going to, you know, it looks like a a gift. And then when we unwrap it, we're going to find FDA is going to shut down the industry and it's going to be regulated like a pharmaceutical. And the, you know, the pharma industry is just going to come and take over, so, you know, and all these things. People, you know, I've I've heard people raise these over and over. And I've also what, you know, what shocks me is that they think that I haven't taken those objections seriously. Like, I hope we can pick some and just go through them because I do take them seriously. They're just wrong. Okay. And they're not like maybe wrong. 
or it's a, you know, people can disagree. There's a lot that reasonable people can disagree about out there. This isn't one of those things. And we can sort of explain why. The other yeah, thing, let's is, jump into those. Okay. Yeah, okay. dive into one. Yeah. So, okay. So let's just talk about what Schedule 3 would mean from an enforcement perspective, yes. right? Like and there's no talk, knock kind of stuff, right? I've heard and all that stuff, right? Here's reality. There is no enforcement right now when cannabis is in Schedule 1 or, you know, very, there's minimal enforcement. Most of it is state level stuff, right? If the federal government wants to enforce, it can right now do everything it could do with cannabis in Schedule 3 and more, right? So if there were or were to be in the future a desire to enforce and shut down the cannabis industry, that could happen today with cannabis in Schedule 1 or if cannabis were in Schedule 3 later. Schedule 3 does not People are correct that it doesn't remove the risk of enforcement. Where they go wrong is the idea, this assumption. And listen to what I'm saying. It seems like people think that Schedule 1 is a safety net for the cannabis industry. Nothing could be further from the truth. Schedule 1 criminalizes everything. Everything, right? And here's what else is totally indisputable. As long as you're in Schedule 1, you got 280E to deal with which has everybody circle on the freaking drain, okay? So in Schedule 3, we all agree, would relieve that. So stop it. That just stop it. That you, if you're going to talk about Schedule 3 being an enforcement risk, you need to explain why the move to Schedule 3 would trigger enforcement. And when I ask people that, they say, well, look, Schedule 3 has prescription requirements and it has doctors would have to be registered with DEA and you know, the FDA uh, regulates things like ketamine and it requires all blah, 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 right? Yes, if they enforce Schedule 3, if they enforce the Schedule 3 requirements, that would be problematic. But it would be more problematic if they enforce the Schedule 1 requirements. So it's kind of a, it's, it's not rational to look at it that way. Instead, you have to look at, will they enforce the Schedule 3 requirements? And if the answer is yes, then you have to ask yourself, okay, so if I'm defending Schedule 1 now, would the same people who would enforce Schedule 3 not enforce Schedule 1? It makes no sense. No one needs Schedule 3 to enforce and shut down the industry. They could do it in Schedule 1. It would be a gigantic waste of time to do that, right? And anyway, if they change their minds later, they can do it in either world. So it's just, you got to stop looking at it that way. And if, and if that's not enough to convince you, here's the last point. To enforce in a way that would shut down the industry. They would have to, you got to look, this is an industry that's $40 billion, last I checked, right? A $40 yeah. billion dollar nationwide industry. And you have DEA, go check their budget, all right? Look at the staff they have, okay? The way the federal government enforces laws is usually they, they, they either have to have appropriations from Congress, which come from legislation, right? Which we do not have here. The administrative process is not giving anyone any money to hire more people or do more against the cannabis industry. So whatever agency was going to do this, they would have to take money from themselves. They'd have to shut down other programs to do it, right? Or they'd have to get an act of Congress, which we all know how difficult that is. And again, even if they wanted to and could, they could do it while it's in Schedule 1 anyway, right? So they don't have the resources now. Think about what it would cost DEA to go shut down every business, you know? The way they normally do programs like that is they, in, they enlist the states to help them. It's, you know, they'll pay the states money. It's called conditional spending. And in, in exchange for that money, the states agree to cooperate with a federal program. But, but query this. What state with a medical marijuana or recreational, you know, adult use program is going to take some federal money in exchange for helping the feds shut down the, the thing that's driving Absolutely. tax revenue into their own coffers and just destroy the employment of all those people. And, you know, it's ridiculous. It's literally, it's practically impossible for that to happen overnight. Now, I'm not saying it couldn't happen down the line. Of course, if there were a huge change in the priorities of the federal government, they could do, do something. But the fact is, it would be very difficult. And if they wanted to, they could do it under Schedule 1 easier than they could under Schedule 3. That's the point. So everybody needs to calm down about all that. For sure. And I, I think we all in agreement there that it's unlikely that the states who are receiving all that tax revenue would decide, you know what, federal government, we'll take you'll take your advice. You guys can go. We don't want that cash flow. 
Yeah, you guys, next state, please. What about 280E? I, I think that's the topic that I think, as exactly like you said, everybody can unify behind. But from some of the things that I read from others was that they were fearful that if 280E gets removed, that another tax code, and I understand that's kind of like what's behind door number two, we don't know. Is that one where there's likely a chance to review or like to argue against any sort of new tax code? Or that's one where they may add a different one in and we're all stuck with that in the future? Is that just kind of I don't think I understand clear? the objection. I mean, let me just say this. 280E, it's simple. It applies to trafficking in Schedule 1 or 2 substances. That's it. So if you're a Schedule 3 substance, even if you're trafficking in it, and everybody would still be trafficking because they're not going to register with DEA. You know what I'm saying? So you're still trafficking. If it does go to Schedule 3, I had a uh, thought. There's an infrastructure at every state to obtain a pharmaceutical license, right, to then distribute a Schedule 3 narcotic. So there, if it goes to Schedule 3, are they going to let all of these operators have a grace period to obtain a pharmaceutical license? And then they're... Why would they? Why would they? Yeah, I mean, why I would they protect their businesses. Why wouldn't? Why are you saying why would the states allow that? No, I'm saying everybody is currently violating federal law. Yes, right. If you move it to Schedule Three, it will cost you money to get some extra licensing regime or whatever, and you could just keep conducting your business exactly the way you are now. So why would anyone do that? Now, could they? So could if I'm a, if I'm a cannabis business. And I want to register with DEA now that it's in Schedule 3, right? You could apply. DEA will not grant you that license. The reason that they won't is because DEA does not get one of the things they look at when they're looking at giving licenses is if you violated state or federal law in the past. And because everybody has, you're, you're, and they say, look, they say we look at the totality of the circumstances, but the fact is they don't give licenses to people who violate federal law, right? ever. Okay. And they're probably not going to. Now, could they? Could DEA be like, yeah, we're going to change that? Sure. Right. They could. I doubt they do. Right. And so I, I kind of think there's not much to see there. There's not much. That makes sense. Like these are things that could, you, you know, we can drum up hypotheticals all day, but no matter which one you drum up, it's going to require those businesses to expend income for something they could just do now and just violate federal law the way they already are. I guess there are companies that might decide we want to enter the thing now, right? Who weren't in before and they might look at becoming registered and and so forth. And that's kind of a different question. And a state could create that lane, I suppose. And that would be, you know, I'd have to think about what that all might mean. But for everybody who's, you know, already in, in this and been doing this, it doesn't change any of that. It also doesn't change the criminal penalties, you know, at all, nor would schedule five, right? The the penalties are agnostic to the schedule. As long as it's scheduled, the criminal penalties exist. Okay. And last point, one myth I want to dispel is the idea that descheduling, you know, would somehow make cannabis and the cannabis industry legal. That's not true. Because even if you descheduled cannabis, the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act requires FDA approval of any drug, which cannabis counts as a drug under the broad definition before it may be marketed in interstate commerce, okay? So while you technically could try to do it in intrastate, like within the borders of the state, suffice to say that the way the federal government interprets interstate commerce, if you're advertising at all, then anywhere, then very likely, you know, and if anything, any part of the product you make or the way you make it, the machines you use, if any piece of that, any screw on any machine traveled in interstate commerce to get to your place, then you're already in interstate commerce under the definition. So there's really no way around it. Without FDA approval, which we don't have and won't have, right? It's still illegal, okay? So at the end of the day, descheduling does not solve this problem. So people who are like deschedule or bust, they often, in my experience, almost always, every person I've spoken to who's taken that position doesn't understand really what descheduling would and would not mean, okay? So these are some of the myths that I see that I I really want to combat. I think you just destroyed a lot of people's uh, uh, bubble, that of a perfect dream scenario. Right. And the criminal penalties, let's just get that off the table, right? A lot of people are like, well, it would remove the criminal penalties. And that's true. 
But these are the same people who were quick to criticize Joe Biden when he pardoned everybody for the federal possession stuff. And they were like, that didn't do anything because nobody's in jail for federal possession. Right. You're right. You know what people are in jail for? Violating state laws. That's the problem. And you know what descheduling won't change? Those state laws. Now, it does. It does. People will point this out. There are triggering provisions in many state laws that say, like, you know, if something moves in the Federal Controlled Substances Act, it moves in ours. But what those people often overlook, and no one's done a 50 state survey on this, but I've looked at a lot of them. Cannabis is spoken to specifically in those statutes. So it's not treated like other substances. And it's not clear that that would those triggering provisions would automatically happen. My point here is that if you're really concerned about criminal penalties, start reforming state laws in the prohibitionist states. OK, I'm not saying it's nothing. I'm a proponent of descheduling. I don't want anyone to misunderstand me. If I had my magic wand and could do anything, I'd deschedule. But the point is, if we really want those bigger reforms, which we all do, it's going to require legislation. Right. And so the, that's that's neither here nor there. None of that is even in play in this process. The only thing that's in play is whether we get schedule three or not. OK, and so that's what we've got to be focused on. How do we get around the medical use aspect? So lawmakers are citing from NIDA that there's not enough research demonstrating the medical purposes of cannabis. But the director of NIDA then said that having it schedule one prohibits the ability to do the type of research. So how do we get past that cat and mouse game? Yeah, so HHS has already said that cannabis does have a currently accepted medical use and treatment in the United States, if you believe that they recommended schedule three, which I do, right? So NIDA can say whatever it wants. but Are they really going to disagree with HHS? They're part of HHS. HHS is Secretary Becerra is above, you know, way above them. Okay, and even if that weren't so, and all due respect to Dr. Volkow, who actually has said some really progressive things, and I'm not trying to criticize her or say I know more than she does about the science. Okay, I don't. I'm not a scientist. That said. HHS by statute is the the authority on scientific and medical questions for the federal government. More importantly, in the United States, we have a thing called federalism, and it says that the medical profession and what is and isn't legitimate medical use is a state determined matter. And by the way, that's very likely what HHS based its decision on. So whatever Dr. Volkow or anybody else might think about what the evidence says, the states have spoken and doctors across the country are recommending this stuff in treatment to patients. It is either the case that those doctors are committing malpractice or worse, they're drug pushers, right, who are viol- who should be in jail, right? And those patients are either drug addicts who, you know, or, or it's the case that HHS is right and it actually is medical and that's already been determined. So that's, you know, a big part of this. Now, on Dr. Volkow's point about research, this is super duper important. A lot of people believe that if things move to schedule three or five or whatever, that there will be research benefits, right? And I got into this whole game because of research and helping Dr. Sue Sisley and Scottsdale Research Institute help veterans. That's how I got into all this, all right? So I care about research more than any other, I think. I can't say that, but a lot, a lot, okay? Unfortunately, the research provisions, which were recently amended, okay, through the uh, Medical Marijuana and Cannabidiol Research Expansion Act in, what was it, late 2022. And everybody celebrated this. Oh, yay, we passed the law, cannabis law, it's going to help <laughs> research. And the whole time, if you're a subscriber to On Drugs, you know, the Substack that Matt Zorn and I write, you, will, you go back and look, the whole lead up, I was pounding my hand on the table and screaming from the mountaintops that it's actually going to make research harder to do for cannabis, right? And when it was passed, Guess who got on Twitter or X or whatever it is and said, took responsibility for having drafted and pushed that thing through? None other than the greatest, most disgusting troll under the bridge of all, Kevin Sabet, Smart Approaches to Marijuana. Those are the people who wrote and, and promoted that bill. And so it's no surprise to someone who read it, like me, that it's actually not helpful at all. And you know what the biggest way it's not helpful? The biggest way it's not helpful is that it says it makes all the cannabis research restrictions dependent not on cannabis scheduling, like every other substance, but on it being cannabis itself. So it says, here are the restrictions that apply to cannabis. It doesn't say if cannabis is in schedule one, it says cannabis. So move it to schedule three, move it to schedule five, doesn't matter. 
it's still cannabis. And those research restrictions still apply. And Kevin Sabet just whipped our ass right in front of the whole school. Okay. So that's a problem. Now, I hope I'm wrong about that, but I'm not. So Dr. Volkow, you know, I hear her about wanting research restrictions. I'm on her side with that. I want those removed, right? But we're going to need to do some hard work to get that done. Now, my hope is we move it to Schedule 3. People realize I'm right about this, right? And then it gets changed quickly. But this is another thing that nobody talks about. Everybody just assumes that it'll help research. And I get that because it's kind of intuitive. You know, you would think it would. Unfortunately, the enemies of cannabis have gone to great lengths to reinforce and reinforce and weave and double weave and double down and triple down all of these restrictions so that we're going to be untying this knot for a long time. Does Schedule 3 change international policy in terms of tariffs and export and import, right? I mean, I know that research couldn't be done in the U.S. exactly like we just described, but if there's able to be import, export, you look at Israel, right? There's other countries that have research capabilities. Does this help the international community at all? In terms of like the macro society, human society, it does. This is where we get. This is where we get into the treaty issue. So this dovetails right into the treaty issue. So yes, Schedule One and Schedule Two have certain restrictions that, you know, import export restrictions, quotas and reporting requirements that don't apply under Schedule Three. Those extra restrictions are part of the effort to ensure treaty compliance for substances that are regulated under the Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs. Okay. That's why historically DEA has said a substance has to be in schedule one or two if it's subject to control under uh, the single convention. What, and so you'll see a lot of people say, well, Shane doesn't know what he's talking about because, you know, they can't move it to schedule three because of the treaty. And they've said that. And there's this thing on DEA's website that's like a note on treaty compliance or whatever, you know. Of course, I know about that. And the reason that the, what those people are missing, and I, I, I want to be clear, I sound like I'm very frustrated with people. And I actually understand these are the people who are the most engaged. And I don't actually blame anyone for not knowing this because it's like you'd have to read everything in the world and no one has time to do that. Nonetheless, I'm frustrated because I, I want clarity and I want us to win. So here's the truth. The truth is you're correct. That is what DEA historically has said. However, it hasn't always said that. When the, Clinton, when the Clinton administration wanted to reschedule synthetic THC drugs that were approved by FDA, DEA was like, uh-oh, they're cannabis. What are we going to do? And they said, I know what we'll do. We'll move them to Schedule 3 and other schedules, and then we'll impose those import-export quota, blah, 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 restrictions through separate regulations. That will ensure treaty compliance and allow us to, to, remove, to put the substance in the other schedule at the same time. It did the same thing in 2018 with Epidiolex, right? Epidiolex, another cannabis-derived drug, subject to control under the single convention, moved. It was FDA approved, so it had a currently accepted medical use. And FDA was like, look, you should move this to Schedule 5 or deschedule it. DEA said, uh-oh, but treaty compliance, what do we do? They you know, noted this thing that they've always said, Schedule 1 or 2. And they said, but we can do this special move where we move it to Schedule 5 and impose these requirements through a separate rule for import-export, da-da-da-da-da, right? So there's historical precedent, not one time, but multiple times. And those are just the ones that I'm going to talk about here. But there are, this can be done, okay? Not only that, but the State Department recently came out in a, in a speech that it gave on behalf of the United States in Vienna, talking to the International Narcotics Control Board, which is the, the, high, the enforcement wing of the single convention, and explained that the single convention isn't about policing domestic policy. It's about international trade, right? And that was a that was a pretty big, bold statement for the U.S. to make because it's kind of a departure from their normal way of saying things, but it was recent. And it's kind of obvious to me that they're doing that in, you know, they're, they're announcing a kind of a change of how they view the treaty. So people who are really paying attention, it's not that I don't know about the treaty. I do. It's that I know more <laughs> about it. And there are ways around it. Now, could DEA decide that despite all this, it still wants to call, pull the treaty card to keep cannabis in Schedule 1 or 2? Yes, it could. We have to hope that it doesn't. If it does, though, guess who wrote a law review article a while back explaining why this whole thing, this whole letting the UN tell us what domestic criminal law should be in the United States, which is what this does, um, is unconstitutional. 
yours truly and Matt Zorn. So not only are we aware of this, we're like way out in front of it. We published the, the, the deepest possible rebuttal months before any of this started. So again, sorry for sounding like arrogant probably and like mean. I, I actually understand why people don't understand this. I'm just very tired having written the law review article about it. I'm a little bit tired of having to, to see the same objections being floated around over and over. Yeah, I think as one, like as you clearly alluded to, it's more of like a secondary problem that you see down the road that you think is easily, at least let's easily in, in context and comparison, but one that can definitely be uh, overcome. So, and, and given your understanding of the DEA and some of the specific policies and the inner workings that I think you have a better grasp on than most anyone, it's, it's, it's obvious to why you'd be frustrated because you understand the certain principles at play and which levers need to be pulled. But speaking on the DEA, does the scheduling have anything to do with the Georgia pharmacies and them threatening the Georgia, the Georgia pharmacies over dispensing medical marijuana under the state law? No, so those dispensaries do the, their those pharmacies are, are selling Epidiolex too. But Epidiolex is FDA approved and therefore can be dispensed with a prescription. But you can't write a prescription for medical marijuana because federally, federally right. And so those Georgia pharmacies are putting their registration with DEA, which they have to have as a practitioner at risk by saying they're going to dispense medical marijuana, right, on a doctor's recommendation, because that violates federal law in a, in a different way and one that DEA still regulates. And so I, you know, when this all started happening, I was shocked and people, you know, reporters called me and asked me, but I'm like, yeah, man, I would be surprised if DEA doesn't jump on that. And then like days later, D, you know, we saw DEA jumping on it. So that doesn't surprise me. And it's not inconsistent with anything that I'm saying. How do you see that ending? How do I see it ending? I mean, I think that things will stay the same that they were before, meaning it doesn't, doesn't get dispensed from dispensaries. It gets dispensed. I'm sorry. It doesn't get dispensed from pharmacies. It gets dispensed from dispensaries. You know? and, and until the federal law changes in a much broader way, we're, we're stuck with that. And, and notice, notice, by the way, how, you know, no offense to dispensaries, but pharmacists are state licensed and regulated and we trust them to kind of keep us safe in a lot of ways with other substances. And you might have criticisms of that way of doing things. I'm not here to argue with you about that. But we do have, at least the idea is that it's safer. That's why we have pharmacies and doctors. You know what I'm saying? Notice that federal prohibition, which isn't being enforced in any other way, is here to stop us from having those safety mechanisms used to keep us safe when it comes to pharmacies and cannabis, right? So I wonder, what I wonder is, why aren't people putting more pressure on DEA to, to like explain that? You know, at the end of the day, they're allowed to make um, exceptions to federal law where doing so is consistent with public health and safety. And query, how could it not be consistent with public health and safety to allow the very channels that we use to promote public health and safety to run with respect to this thing that you say is so dangerous? If you're not going to enforce the federal law because you can't because of roar back of far, right? How can you argue that it's not safe? And this is something I wanted to say. This is a a point that I wanted to make about the importance of HHS's recommendation, independent of scheduling, which people, I think, overlook. The fact that, that HHS has said that cannabis has a currently accepted medical use means DEA can't really argue against that, okay? Because they're bound under statute to defer to HHS on that, okay? Because they're a law enforcement agency. What I think should happen, if I were a governor, if I were, you know, governor of if I were Jared Polis, if I were, um, you know, the governor of Ohio, whatever, right? I would say to DEA, huh, so you have authority to waive all the CSA's requirements if doing so would be consistent with the public health and safety, right? Yes. You also aren't allowed to enforce federal law or spend any funds to enforce federal law uh, if doing so would interfere with my medical marijuana market, right? Yes, that's roar back or far, repeatedly. OK. Hmm. So wouldn't it be consistent with public health and safety for you to exempt the doctors, practitioners and patients who are operating under those medical marijuana markets that you can't enforce against anyway? Wouldn't that be how could it not be? We know now that HHS has said that that's legitimate medical use. Right. So you can't hide behind that anymore. And guess what would happen if they did that? Here's the thing. You ready for this? If they waived the CSA's requirements from those folks, guess who's out from under 280E because they're no longer trafficking in a Schedule One substance? 
So regardless, regardless of scheduling, you could keep it in schedule one. If they got this waiver, which I think every state should be, if I were a governor, that's what I'd be pushing for. If you got that, which DEA could hardly deny in any rational way, then you would get your entire medical marijuana market out from under 280E. Why don't we start doing that? You know? I mean, that sounds like a low-hanging fruit that one should be attacked immediately, easily, or quickly. Right. But but notice that instead of being able to, to do that and push that, I'm too busy having to argue with people about whether this is significant or not. That's the problem. And I'm sorry, again, I'm fired up about it because I want to win. You know what I mean? I don't. And I'm not saying that, you know, that is why that's significant. And I'm putting it out there. You know, anybody can go do it now. I'm saying it. I hope they do. And notice to all the people out there who say, all oh, these lawyers just want to make money. If I wanted to make money, I'd keep it secret, I'd keep it to myself. And I'd go try to make money off of it. Right. I'm saying it on this podcast because I want to help and I don't care who gets the money. You know what I'm saying? So anyway. What about the hemp-based cannabinoids and the synthetically derived? What about them? How is that going to work? Do you see that being adjusted in the farm bill and them minimizing what's going on in Minnesota? Or do you see it being one where the DA's got their hands full with a few different things? And this one is one where they'll just pump this for down the road. Because it it's could wild, be like a, it could be a situation where like hemp then becomes the major crop that provides all cannabinoids for the entire industry. Right. And if you look at like economics, there's canopy growth limits. Right. Like you could see the majority of form factors like beverages and edibles all being derived from hemp. And they just completely gloss over this whole, quote unquote, cannabis THC industry and provide the same products in existing retail locations under the farm bill. Yeah. I mean, I think it's wild. I think that that is it is wild and it's a, it's absurd. I mean, we're talking about the same things. So they should, in the end, in the end, what do I think will happen? They're going to be treated like the same things eventually because they are. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Now, in the meantime, I think it's a very, very complicated question to try to address in a sentence. But I think that the bottom line to me with this question is what happens with, with hemp has to take into account the, the reality that you have something that is not regulated at all or is regulated at a much lower level, right? That you, what under the scenario you just described would then become mainstream and would actually block out the regulated product market. Now, I know before the pitchforks come out that there are state regulations of hemp. And I know that the hemp companies are very, very, they're ready to be regulated. They're not trying to avoid regulation. Fair enough. Nonetheless. Stop playing with me. We all know that it's that, you know, the folks selling this stuff in a gas station bathroom and God knows where because it's hemp, right, are are not regulating it in the way that these other companies that have all the requirements and state regulations uh, are. And I'm not now I'm a libertarian. I'm a very, very much a libertarian. But I would just tell you as an advocate for the industry and in a big, you know, proponent of rational reform here, I would just say that we should think very carefully about who we send out as our champion to, to, to end this war against cannabis once and for all, right? In other words, you know, when, when, the, when the big wars used to happen, they, the, the, the two sides would send out their champion, they would send out the best representative of them at, that they could possibly come up with. Maybe that is the less regulated hemp, maybe. Think about it, though. That's all I'm saying. Like. We need to make sure that because what's going to happen is if you if you remove all the restrictions and make it the Wild West, the opponents of cannabis are going to have a field day with every child who's sick. Everything that happens, they're going to say that the state markets failed and they won't limit that criticism to hemp. They're already doing it. Most of the stuff that people say against cannabis from the Kevin Sabet side and, and, you know, when they're talking to Congress and in their newsletters, it's actually unregulated products that they're that they're casting aspersions on and they lump them together and we all are hurt by that that's what i'm saying who is achilles who is ajax for us right who's hector all right i'm not going to try to sit here and win to tell you i would just say that even as a libertarian who's not a big fan of, of regulation and i know that there are probably a lot of inefficient regulations that are counterproductive out there what i would tell you is we need to to as a group <laughs> 
think about what is the best model we can put out there to represent us as we move forward to try to legalize, you know, and, and get this thing fully done. That's well said. So complicated, though, given that everyone's individual self-interest from their own states or what, let's call it, quote unquote, industry that they operate in, whether hemp or cannabis. But you're right. There needs to be a more unified kind of messaging and uh, how that happens and how they proceed. It's very difficult. To say. If so I can say one before, thing about that, yeah. you're right that it's very, Please. very complicated. The law here is complicated. But what you actually said really simplifies it because you can generally tell what someone's going to argue based on what money they will or will not get from the result of yes. their position. And that is something that I fear is going to destroy us. So I can't make people, and I don't know a simple, I'm not Dr. Phil. I don't, you know, I'm just a lawyer. I can tell you though, I'm worried because all of us need to start thinking beyond next week and yes. the ticker price on whatever investment you have, if this is going to work. Now, I understand there are certain people who are in this for the short run gain and God bless you, like no judgment. I'm just saying for those of us who are actually wanting reform that will last and, and be meaningful, we have to be uh, less short sighted. I think that's perfectly said. And I just want to end it on on one note, Shane. Obviously, there's a bunch of things that need to happen in the next 30, 60, 90 days. If you could just lay out in in clearest, quick bullet points, if you were the man leading the charge, what were the steps that you would see just so that people could understand how critical from an organizational standpoint that these additional tests need to happen in order to proceed in hopes to be successful? So on the rescheduling front or in the whole rescheduling? The whole, yeah, I mean, you, we don't have enough time for you to solve all those. I was about problems. to say, man, yeah. you're, you're like, like, Whoa. <laughs> we need to start by everyone needs to take some time to be mindful in the morning and do breath work. And, you know, like, I don't know, like. I'm working on it too. You got a good therapist. Like, headspace, headspace. <laughs> hey, okay, on rescheduling. <clears throat> on rescheduling. Here's what needs to happen. We know that from even the redacted documents that we've gotten, that HHS is looking at studies that have mainly, the, they've focused on the ones that have come out since 2016. We need experts, medical, scientific experts, you know, to help us. I, I'm trying, but I'm not a scientist. You know, I, uh, I avoided... Uh, subjects that had clear right or wrong answers all the way through school. Um, and so, but we need those people, the, the science bowl team to help us identify those studies, make a big list of them, tell us what they say, what their bottom line is, right? The good ones and the bad ones. And we need to be prepared to marshal that evidence effectively when we get a proposed rule. That is like a big, big thing that needs to be done, okay? The second thing that we need to do as a community is we need to organize. So if you have access to those experts, if you have connections to the, to the, to the state authorities who might be able to have something to say about this, former regulators, current regulators who might be able to, might, you know, be willing to sign a comment or, you know, have one drafted and review it and that's helped with all this, you need, we need to get those people lined up now. So um, if you have money, right, to dedicate to get this work done, which will require lawyers and the doctors and scientists who I just talked to, you know, we'll try to get them to do it. Everybody's going to do as much as they can. But the bottom line is people can do a lot more faster when they're paid. Take me, for example. I'd love to do all of this for free, but I have a family and I have a firm that I work for and they're not going to let me do it, you know, all of it. But if I were paid, yes. And that's not just me. That's everybody. So if you have that money, and I know not many people have it right now, but it's just super important that we get that that funding to the people who can actually do the work. That's incredibly important. If you're in a position with a business or an organization that has a stake in this, get in touch with someone who's writing comments and is getting prepared and say, I'd like to join. You know, I'd like to have an opportunity to join and sign on to that comment and be a part of this process, right? That's something that needs to happen. And I think the last thing is try, I think all of us right now should be trying to quell the debate and that means taking people's views seriously, but we need to just, these points that I'm making, I hope people will write them down and spread the gospel, right? And not in a way to have an endless debate, but to say, we can put that on pause right now to support Schedule 3. And I hope that our rhetoric on social media and so forth becomes a lot more unified around getting this done as opposed to fighting each other and getting in each other's way. So 
those are the main things and it needs to be done yesterday. And if you have any questions about any of this, maybe the first thing to do is to email me or, you know, any of the uh, many people out there. And, you know, I could give a big list if, if that would be helpful. You know, Jonathan Havens at Saul Ewing, Andrew Klein at Perkins Coie, uh, Howard Splamberg at Arnold and Porter, you know, me, Matt Zorn, uh, you know, I could keep going. And there's so many and I don't mean to leave anybody out. Just find a competent expert and and reach out and ask your question. You know, I'm not going to charge you for that. I'll, I want to plug you in. Right. So the, I guess those are my my key list of to do's for everybody. I think that's perfect. And I think we should leave it there because we got a lot of work to do in the next period of time. So Shane, for our listeners, they want to get in touch. They want to read On Drugs. Where can they find you? So On Drugs uh, is ondrugs.substack.com. And you can read most everything we put out without, without you know doing a paid subscription. There's some things we reserve for pay. And I just want to say, while I'm on the subject, you know, Matt and I don't get rich off of that. We use that to then fund the FOIA lawsuits that are getting the redacted stuff and to fund getting all those documents and organizing them and all of that. That's what we use that money for. And so you're helping the cause there and you're not just like, you know, paying for, for me to have a Porsche or something, which I do not. Which would be um, sick. You want to buy me a Porsche? Let me know. But that's different. <laughs> so, but then, um, you know, as far as getting in touch with me, my my email is um, spenningtonporterwright.com. You can find me on on their, you know, website. And I'm admin.law on X if you want to find me there. I've been talking cannabis more and more. It's funny. One thing I was just leave people with, I have a very funny network because I come from a very white shoe conservative law background. And so I have all that crew in, you know, a lot of legal academics and stuff that I write these law review articles with. And then I have like the cannabis movement. And it's just so funny to see them like kind of butt up against each other. But that's a, you know, watching my, my feed is pretty hilarious. It's a beautiful Venn diagram. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for anyway, taking the time. Thanks so Shane. much for having me, guys. Appreciate I the time. It. Yeah, thank My you. Book. We really appreciate your time.